The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter diamond Titus, and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into OCO Advisor has been a financial advisor here, but was also an advisor back in the UK. So, you know, all sorts of experience all over the planet, has a degree in business law, amongst others. So we all need to behave. Everybody sit up straight and found an app to help consumers invest ethically, but is here today to talk about helping advisors do the same. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Tom Culver, welcome. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me. Well, wow, really got to dust off the uh, the cobwebs of the resume there to get back to the degree and everything. So thank you. Well, some of us need to remember we had those things, right? It's yes. been a long time. <laughs> they, were, they were very important once upon a time. So, yeah. Remember? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It'd be the first thing you might say, not so much anymore, not so much. So very keen to dive into OCO Advisor. But first, just to get to know you a little better, um, you have been on the Ensemble podcast before or slash XY Advisor when it was that, but let's get to know you through your use of technology. What's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Uh, I do use emojis. I, 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 they creep into even my business texts these days, uh, but it's mostly through Slack. So, you know, we work with a lot of our teams and customers through Slack, and that's where the emoji comes in. So I think probably my most used emoji uh, that I can share is probably the thank you emoji. Nice. When people do great things for you. It's always nice to say thanks. Nice. I've got one actually we use a lot in Slack. We use Slack for the business too. I think it's I can't believe more businesses don't have it actually in advice because it's so great for keeping in touch with the team. But it's we've got this actually moving emoji that's like a head slap. Oh, and yes. So we use that a fair bit, I've got to say, <laughs> just for situations yeah. or what we're all dealing with, for sure. And now we're all permanently attached to our smartphones. Um, so if you had to wipe everything off the smartphone and you just had to keep three apps and only three apps, which ones would you keep? Mm, it's a tough one. Luckily, I'm not a social media user, so I actually got rid of all my social media apps some time ago for kind of mental mental health issues and focus issues. Um, yep. So for me, it's really about, I guess, messaging to keep in touch with my 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 family and friends. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't live without Slack, as I've already said, um, yep. and then Netflix for a bit of uh, you know Netflix and chill. I think. Nice. Well done. You know, that that's the first time Netflix or any sort of streaming service has come up. So I like it. I mm. like it. Entertainment. And in fact, now you've prompted me, I don't think I've got it on my phone. So yeah, clearly I've got changer. a job to do when we finish recording. Yeah. All right. Let's dive into OCO Advisor, shall we? So just to give everybody who hasn't heard of the, heard the tool a sense of basically where it sits in the advice tech space, sort of what category do you guys fall under? Who do you normally get lined up against? Just give us a feel initially. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, OCO Advisor is a very, very specific tool for advisors to engage with their clients around sustainable investing. 
what the platform does and kind of where we sit in the advice space, again, is very, very specific. So mm. as we've kind of built the platform and as we work with our partners and our advisors, we're very cognizant of the fact that we're not trying to become the next CRM. We're not trying to get advisors to move all their stuff, which they've already moved you know, many times throughout their careers to yet another platform. And so our platform is designed to kind of complement everything else that kind of goes on in an advisor's life um, and all the other systems that they use. And so where that kind of makes us fit is that we're essentially a risk profiling tool, but for sustainability. And that's a great yeah. way to think about us because risk profiling is an incredibly important part of the advice process, but it's usually a supplementary part where you might use an external provider away from your CRM or your portfolio management tool. And it's something that you might dip out of your normal process with, with a client to use the, the platform, use the information, and then come back into your advice process. And so OCO Advisor is very, very similar to that. If a client wants to include sustainability in their decision-making and their advice, at some point through the advice process, typically after the risk profile, the advisor would jump out and use our platform to kind of gather information, understand the client's needs, do some research and discovery and analytics in our platform, and then feed back into the, the usual advice process. Okay. And so, so the way then, um, with this is interesting. So the way you're seeing it is almost like a second layer of profiling. So you've done your first layer. Um, do you then suggest that there's like a more generic question at that first level that's sort of almost digging into their interest into such a thing before you th would then introduce the fact, okay, let's get to know you a bit better about your values? Is that how you'd generally get people or suggest advisors approach it? That, that that's exactly right. I mean, typically, you know, I think we'll, we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but typically the types of advisors that we work with and we deal with, this isn't an area of absolute expertise to them. And it's, and it's not also an area that is relevant to all their clients. Right. So it is about just giving an advisor the opportunity to ask a very simple one or two questions in the normal fact finding process, you know, something along the lines of, um, do you want to include sustainability values or have a values conversation around environmental and social issues when we get to your investment advice? And if the client says yes, then it's fantastic. It's an acknowledgement from the advisor and go, look, fantastic. We'll come back to that. But right now, let's continue the process. Let's really get to understand you and know you. And then we'll dig into that a little bit later. And when they nice. dig into it, then they use our platform for that. Nice, nice. Okay. And so before we dive into some of that detail, you guys recently had a rebrand, right? So people might have heard heard of um, the tool under another name. So just run us through. A, I'm curious. I want people to understand what it is. So they're like, oh, that's who you guys are. But also, why? What triggered the rebrand? Great question. So <laughs> uh, we used to be Ethic Advisor. Um, and we did recently rebrand to a new company name called OCO Platforms. And OCO Advisor is one of the tools within our platform that re directly replaces the Ethic Advisor tool. Right. Um, the name itself means uh, it's a play on the German word for eco. We've just removed the two dots that sit over the first O. Um, and it means cool. eco, transparency, and it's, it's a nod towards the fact that that is what we do with our customers. We're, we're helping engage on this conversation around sustainability and transparency. But we wanted to actually step away from the words um, ethics and ethical. Um, and there's, there's lots of reasons for that. But right, rightly or wrongly at the moment, sustainability, ESG, ethics, um, they're very politicized uh, terms these days, particularly within the investment world. Yeah. And that's not actually our mission. Our mission is not to force any client or any advisor to feel that they have to make a particular set of decisions. What our platform is there to do is to help advisors guide their clients to make the decisions that are relevant to them. And so yeah. by stepping away from that word ethics, it really steps more towards where we are as a platform, which is a technology platform that helps guide towards transparency and alignment to a client's needs. And it's an interesting um, challenge, isn't it? And, and look, one we as a practice have been facing in that, you know, I'm the person that's, you know, obsessed by food waste in our house. So we've got all sorts of techniques to try and reduce that. We do every cycle. You know, there's some things we do, but I wouldn't have ever put myself in the um, – sustainability warrior space for investing, right? I wasn't one of those early adopters like there, there are out mm -hmm. there. And to date, and I'm, I'm hoping we draw this out in, in what we cover here, to date it has been a bit like you've got a 
jump into the deep blue sea to do this. It didn't feel like it was something you could gradually introduce into your practice for yourself, let alone your clients. And mm-hmm. so I think it's been needed, you know, something that lets you take your own journey um, as you go along with introducing it to your clients. So is it? So, do you actually recommend that advisors, when they first take it up, is like put yourself through this, assess your own sort of values in terms of sustainability so you've got a position to come from? We, we absolutely do. So the kind of the first part of the demo process when, when we onboard an advisor is actually we do that. So we use the advisor as the dummy client in inverted commas to kind of get them comfortable, get them to kind of understand how the platform works, but use them as the kind of decision-making process and get them to ask the questions that they think that they would ask as a client because that allows them to really get into to how the platform works and to, to see where the value works. It's a really interesting point that you just made about that, about kind of how you live your life as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually the first place that our platform starts. So we don't really kind of talk too much about typical screening criteria and, you know, what you normally hear in the kind of sustainable or ESG world. The very, very first piece of the conversation, which our platform kind of helps advise and engage clients with, is actually understanding it from a client how they live their lives, right. what are their habits and what are their lifestyle factors when it specifically relates to sustainability. because you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. For most consumers out there, they're not sitting there thinking, well, wow, what's a, what's a good ESG screen for me? <laughs> they're sitting there thinking, geez, I, you know what? Plastic really pisses me off. Um, yeah, I'm a really, right? really keen recycler because that is just something that drives me effing mad. Yeah. Um, and so that's actually what our platform tries to capture is these, these kind of lifestyle pieces around who a client is and what they do and how they live their daily lives before then kind of getting into the kind of more classical piece around kind of screening and, and sustainability. And the reason we do that is because it's the connection, um, it's the really important connection, which advisors are so good at having a conversation on and unpacking, and we really want to understand about the clients and then take them through that journey. Yeah, and it's look, it's an interesting point too. I've I've had lots of conversations, you know, you're out chatting and and things like ESG, I mean, when you're in the industry it comes up because it's, you know, it's the new black, isn't it? It's the new conversation that we're all covering. Yeah. Um but also with the public and their awareness of not so much with the, with investing but just generally. And for example, you know, I might encounter women who had no have no clue that in fact there could be almost a gender lens or a gender parity lens they could apply the way that they invest. Like it's just not – and when they hear ESG or ethical or sustainable, that's not necessarily the thing that pops to mind because it, but it is a value for them. It's like they might be somebody that fiercely believes we need to get better at that in business and in boards, but they don't rec- – like they've never made that connection that that belief can be something that you could then apply, you know. And so there's so many layers of this. We've got this acronym, you know, this ESG thing, and it's it's covering 427 <laughs> values. Like it's ludicrously wide what you can have as something that you see as really important. And that, that, that is absolutely spot on. And that is that is ultimately what the problem is that we're trying to solve with with between both advisor and client is to kind of become this common language for advisors and, and intermediaries to be able to have this conversation with a client, but also to help reshape what the conversation is from a client's perspective. It's, as we say, you know, it, it, it's not about the kind of the ESG criteria necessarily. It's about what is the sustainability value that the client has that's important to them that's going to influence the outcome. And that, and that yeah. can be, you know, anything and everything from, you know, wanting to buy an EV because they really believe in the future around emissions or, as you say, it's around gender equality and and promoting those pieces through diversity in business or in board or even just making sure that they're backing companies that have really great um, working mother policies or return to work policies around parenthood, for example. And these, yeah. these are all really kind of key driving motivators that, that kind of grind the gears or drive emotion in, in kind of human beings. Um, and trying to get that to then factor in into into what that looks like through kind of investment and advice is is really the next challenge that advisors are there to to facilitate. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean it's 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 a it's a massive massive piece. Um, but y- y- what you're talking about is exactly what we're talking about, which is this is this is about sustainability values and values is is the really critical key word here. Um, we could sub out sustainability for, for almost anything, but really what we're trying to get to is, is the values-led decisions that clients want to make. Yeah, and, it, and you know, every time I've seen um, somebody engage this way as, as a client, um, 
it just it connects them so deeply to whatever that you've done that for, whether it's their super or an investment or whatever it is, it creates these, you know, tendrils of link to that mm-hmm. investment that's that's far deeper and means they're far more interested and engaged and also are going to, it, it's not the sort of money they're going to forget about, you know, whereas, I mean, super can often fall into that category where it's buff, yeah. that's for later, right? Whereas if there's a purpose for that money, like if they can see how it reflects them, um, then that's the last thing that's going to happen. It's not going to be about for later. It's about what it can do now. You know, it's about what that the impact of that money can have. Um, and that's an exciting prospect, I think, for some of the things we do, which are a bit long term. You know, they're a bit oh, far out. Yes. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I haven't been an advisor on, on the front line for a few years now, but, you know, I, I have very clear memories of clients' eyes glazing over as I talk <laughs> through asset allocation and the benefits of diversification and, you know, the conviction that we have in particular investments within a portfolio that we want to highlight. If, you know, for the majority of clients, that, that's not overly important. There's some interest there because it's, it's their money, but it's not going to, generate a really deep and meaningful conversation and build a relationship and values is and and that's it you know if you can give if you can hold a conversation around something that's important to a client but most importantly give a client agency over some of the decisions or the outcomes which is what kind of sustainability led values investing does um it's incredibly powerful and it builds incredibly deep and powerful relationships with clients in a way that is can otherwise be very very hard to do. Yeah, and I was just um actually I just watched a um McCrindle generational report. They just released their latest uh, report on the generations. And what's interesting is we've made assumptions about some of the older. Well, I'll put my my generation in this Gen X. Some of the older generations and what influences them, and people are forgetting that their kids are a direct influence on their decisions. And so the messaging that um, these, you know, the older generations are getting from their children about these issues is as strong as external messaging. Mm-hmm. So we can think that maybe say Gen X isn't as interested. It's like, well, their kids surely are, you know, and so if they're hearing that from the children and they're participating in the education kids now get on these sort of issues, then absolutely they're going to start to be more and more informed um, and want to be more and more informed. So I think we probably need to take away our sort of assumptions about who wants to do this type of sort of lens, you know, across their portfolio and, like you say, ask the question. We've just got to ask, is this something you'd like to do? Um, and to that point, so the first step, hey, help them work out, their values. So it's sort of what's in, what's out, you know, what are the things that you deeply care about? Then I'm assuming that the next phase is then, well, how does that look against what you've currently got? Is that what the, what the tool does next to sort of assess their current investments against those those values? Yeah, that, that that's exactly right. So, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about the fact that we're, you know, we're talking about sustainability and sustainability values and advice, but Ultimately, you know, who we are as a business is we're, we're a technology business and we're a data platform. Um, and so everything that we kind of do in the back end, you know, our secret source as a company is how our profiling system works. Yep. Um, and then how that profiling directly then connects into um, kind of direct system analytics. And the first step of that is, is exactly what you just talked about. So after a profile is done, um, it's then essentially a gap analysis. So from where a client thinks they want to be based on these kind of things that are really emotive to them, where do they sit based on where they are invested today or where an advisor might be recommending that they be invested today? And, you know, those recommendations are going to be made on those more classical methods, right? You know, it's it's the off the menu that the existing managed portfolios based on a risk profile and a set of kind of longer term goals. But then how does that align from a values perspective? And for us, that, that means a couple of things for advisors. So again, you know, as, as a platform provider, it's not our job to pass judgment on what that means for either client or advisor. We're very, very careful not to do that. Mm. What we want to do is provide transparency and kind of give over the information to create the state of play. And so that then facilitates a conversation between client and advisor of going, well, look, you know, maybe there is, um, there's some great exposure to areas that you really want to have impact in. So, you know, let's talk about renewables and gender diversity, for example. Yep. But there's also some areas which you wanted to avoid having exposure to. And that could be anything from, um, you know, you know, we have categories that include Trump or gaming or fossil fuels to gambling to 
to whatever it may be that really kind of drives um, a kind of a client's client's agenda. Social media being another one. Yep. And once we understand that, it's actually talking about well, what is the exposure there based on the entire portfolio, based looking down into all the funds that may be within the portfolio and then therefore all the holdings within those funds. What is the true exposure? And that's a really, really powerful conversation point between client and advisor of going, well, look, you said you didn't want having exposure to social media companies, for example, because you don't like the impact that that's having on your children, as an yeah. example. Yeah. Um, as we look through your portfolio, there is some exposure, but for example, it, it's 1%. It's 1% of the entire portfolio. How do you feel about that client? And here are the options and what we can do from here. And yep. again, it gives that agency back to the client and then it facilitates the, the next steps for the advisor to use that platform, which is researching alternatives, uh, potentially researching to build um, satellite positions, which might offset something, um, yep. or simply acknowledging between client and advisor that there, this situation exists, but actually the, the client's okay with that. And we're going to now just going to complete that as part of our advice process. But really importantly for advisors, we're going to record that. We're going to have the audit trail and the compliance trail to show how we've got there, to show how we've got to this outcome. Yeah. Um, and so it really is kind of it's facilitating all of those pieces around the advice process for the advisor and the client. And look, it's an interesting thing that I think um, when those of us who aren't deeply into this just yet sort of look at this, I think we probably figure you've got to, like it's like we've got to exclude everything. The client says, hey, this is what I don't want anymore. It's like, oh, God, I'm going to have to build this portfolio that's like excluding all those things. And that's not just going to be difficult, but also potentially not possible in some circumstances, depending on where their money is and all those sort of things. Whereas I think, um, and you mentioned the word offset, and I think it's it's a great way to look at this is, you know, this is a, this is a journey and client you hear, but okay, we could put, like you say, a satellite, something that will shift that dial. Let's just shift the dial for you and make some changes that start to better represent your values over time as more opportunities come up to do that because it is going to change over time, isn't it? I mean, if if you've uh, done absolutely. this, right? You know, a few years ago, they'd be like, well, there's one fund we could think about. <laughs> Like there wouldn't be, right? I mean, what options would you have had? So I think if, to acknowledge that with the client and say, here's some alternatives, but this is a journey. So we can you, we can incrementally adjust this over time, I think recognizes what's important without having an extreme response that to be quite honest, some clients wouldn't want to pay for that extreme response, you know, a sort of bottom up build. Is that something you guys see in the way that advisors engage with the tool? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, that's kind of how we've built the platform and really why we've built the platform is that again, you know, coming back to this, this central premise and kind of who we are as a business, it's, 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 it's no judgment. And that is even reflective in our profiling. So, and it's, it's a journey that we've been on as well as a business. So the very first version of our kind of profiling or, or, or fact finding tool, um, categorize things as being good or bad. We, we predefined things as being good or bad because we thought that that would help. Right. But actually, what it did was it, it, it put a client in a position where they went, oh, my God, I'm being told all these things are bad. I've got to agree with this, and I've got to say that they're also bad. Whether I believe that or not, or whether I'm thinking about it or not, the system is saying they're bad, so therefore they're bad. Yeah. And that did lead to the, some of those outcomes you just mentioned, which was everything was inscl- excluded, and the advisor was going, oh, my God, what am I, <laughs> on earth am I going to do for this client? And so we, we really, really learned from that. We've taken a step back from that massively. And so we, we've got this, this, this client driven place where our profile doesn't predefine anything. So the client gets to select. Um, yeah. and now the outcome of that is that what we find now for clients is they are just choosing or selecting their real motivators. So rather than selecting a hundred things which are terrible, they're going, well, these are the three things that I really, really care about from an impact perspective. And these are the three things that I really, really care about in terms of an area that I want to avoid and I want zero exposure to. Um, and that has then led to these fantastic outcomes for both client and advisor of going, well, we've got a much more reasonable starting point to have a conversation about. Um, we can start to understand where these drivers are and how serious um, the client is about exposure when we're talking about trade off or offsetting, for example, mm. um, or, or replacing. And it, it enables the advisor to kind of facilitate all of that. The second thing that our platform does really, really well, and it's really powerful, particularly in today's world, is we don't, again, 
we don't take position on pretty much anything. And that means that we don't actually promote anything. We don't promote ESG branded platforms right. or solutions over anything else because that's not always the best alignment for the client. And yeah. in today's world around greenwashing, um, you know, I'm not going to talk about any names, but there's there's obviously lots of stuff going on in the press at the moment of funds and super funds and managers being tagged for saying things that aren't necessarily truly represented in their portfolios or their fund solutions. Yeah. Our platform actually has a look through into all of that as well. So we don't care what the fund manager says. Uh, we don't care if it's badged ESG or not. We're actually looking for alignment to a client and right. that, that, that balance between high, com, high investment conviction um, and balance with clients' values. Yeah, and it's an interesting challenge, isn't it? I mean, um, I had a discussion with somebody, and I think their tech is is a bit early stage, where um, I, they were assessing businesses on this front, and I encouraged them to say, I think we need to assess fund managers on these things too. So not just where they put the money, but how they behave as a corporate citizen. Because I think for clients or the consumer who is passionate about a particular value, if they said, yes, Peter, I'm really passionate about X, whatever that is, gender diversity, and that fund measures up, you know, we run it through, I go on it and it measures up, but the actual fund manager business themselves don't. Well, that's not great. You know, like that's a mismatch. And so I think, you know, I'm hoping there's going to be layers of this over time where we can get better sort of transparency on all of this so that the, the, businesses that are responsible for this money are as accountable as the actual investments are. A hundred percent. And I think that that's where we want to get to. And yeah. I think a first phase on that is, is this education piece around the, the processes that fund managers go through in which to construct their portfolios, particularly when they're including ESG. And, you know, there's, there's various methods to do it, but, you know, the concept of how material an exposure is, um, is, is a challenging one. So yeah. from a client's perspective, if they say, you know, let's just pick another example, I want zero exposure to tobacco, um, a fund manager is able to list a tobacco-free fund because they constitute being tobacco-free as not having direct exposure to tobacco and maybe what less than 1% of the supply chain um, as you look through the entire list of holdings might have some exposure to tobacco. Right. Now, that's fantastic. I mean, that's that's a good outcome. It's yeah. great, serious work from the fund manager, but that's not what the client wanted. That is not their expectation. Their expectation yeah. is zero. Yeah. Um, and so the, the starting point, and again, something that our platform does is it provides that transparency and goes, well, look, there is some exposure, but this is exactly what the exposure is. This is where it is, in which holding, and this is how large it is. And usually that doesn't lead to a change for a client. What it leads to from a client is is knowledge and understanding mm-hmm. and a, feel, a sense of transparency and fairness and going, I now understand everything that I'm looking at. Because if I had found out about this in six months' time after I've just paid the fee to my advisor and I've been invested for six months, I would have been pretty angry. But now I know and I'm happy. Yeah. Look, and, and, you know, awareness is really important and also, um, and balance. I mean, you know, lots of us might ex- expend a whole lot of time and, and I mean, in Australia, we've all got, you know, the multiple bins at home and all that sort of thing for rec- recycling, but we might head out to something, I don't know, like the Easter show or whatever, and we'll buy a can of drink and then it'll end up maybe going into a generic bin. Like very few people would carry that empty can home and then recycle it. Like mm-hmm. we've all got layers of this, right? So it's it's about informing ourselves as to how far do you want to go. And so as long as they've got that information, then they can make that choice. You know, that's okay. Absolutely, absolutely right. No, no judgment. It is about yeah. choice choices for each individual. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the practices that take this on. Talk to me about, you know, are there any characteristics or approaches that you've seen work well for a practice versus those that have struggled? Like, is there anything they could have done better beforehand or, or tools or things they've set up that made it easier to sort of fold something like this into the way they engage with clients? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, on, on the whole, we kind of have probably three, three different, three varying experiences with advisors who kind of come into the platform or that we talk to. The, on the first hand, we get advisors who are extremely excited about having the capability because they are being asked about it by clients directly. So clients are coming to them saying, look, I want to talk about sustainability. 
Um, it's something that's deeply important to me or my family, you know, as we look at the, you know, the entire wealth of, across the generations. And advisors are excited about our solution in that respect because it, it's, a, it's a very quick and simple way for them to upskill, for them to provide an outcome to a client. And it's also very, very engaging with a client. It's, it's a technology-based tool which clients like to use. It looks, it looks pretty. It, it works really well and clients, clients really enjoy it. So there's, there's a lot of value there. Yeah. In the middle tier, we, we get advisors who are going, I think this is something that I should be involved in. Um, I'm increasingly hearing about it, but I know very, very little about it and I'm unsure as to whether any of my clients want it. Right. Um, now those advisors we can work with on exploring the different ways that they might want to position things the types of clients they might want to position the platform with and certain ways of introducing uh, both, you know, that very first outreach and that very first time of introducing the concept to then very much kind of hand-holding as they walk through the first couple of times with clients to, to get them comfortable, both client and advisor. Um, and so that, that works really well. And then we also get advisors who um, just don't believe it's a, don't believe it's a thing. Yeah. Um, they, they, they feel that they genuinely don't have any clients who would be interested in talking about sustainability. And sometimes that is absolutely correct. Um, the challenge we often give to those advisors is, have you asked the question? Um, and they say, well, no, but no client has told me that they want it. And then I, you know, we go along the lines of, well, which client has ever told you they want insurance? Yeah. Um, and it's that same thing, you know, unless you ask a client and understand where this sits with them, you're never going to get a response from a client and you're never going to get in trouble for asking a question. You know, yeah. if the client turns around and says, no, I don't want to talk about sustainability. I think it's a load of rubbish. You've learned something about that client. Yeah. Um, you have, and if you share the same opinion as an advisor, you have built a deeper bond. Um, you know, there, there is no negative outcome there. And that, that's the journey that we go through with those advisors. And typically how that then kind of starts to materialize in those kind of practices, um, the more senior advisor who probably has clients who may not be interested in this area will actually then start talking to the more junior advisors in that business who are dealing with the younger clientele, maybe the next generation in the family, and starting to see the concepts at that kind of lower level and really kind of, I guess, setting up for the future for when those those clients become the primary client of the practice. Yeah, yeah. And it, look, it's an interesting um, positioning and asking is so important. We've sort of gone through this journey with we're in the midst of um, finalising a project for a client portal, a secure client portal, and and I get asked about this, you know, at, at events and, and on stage and, oh, but, you know, there's a whole, there's loads of people who won't do it. You know, the older clients, there's no way they, they'll do it, and we make these sweeping assumptions. And when we've called out to our clients for beta testers, previously um we got you know somebody in their 80s we got a whole lot in their 70s we got them now the reason that was the case is we positioned this sometime previously we were doing a whole lot of spam and cyber security sessions in our webinars for clients we were constantly talking about the risks and so it pre-positioned them for why this was a good idea. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we've got to give people context and we've got to give them an opportunity to settle with something. And then when you introduce it, just ask. And I think the numbers will be much higher than any of us expect. You know, I think there'd be far more people that at the very least that would be curious. Oh, well, I'll do that questionnaire. I'd be interested to see what came out of that, you know. And, and I think that's that's exactly it. I th you know, the the data tells us that there are going to be far more people interested than we might pre presuppose. Yeah. You know, depending on what you look at, you know, there's there's re research that comes out of RIA, which is usually fantastic, that puts the number around ninety percent of the, the advised population want to talk about sustainability. Um, other data points show that, for example. You know, about 60 to 65% of clients feel that they're underserved in their existing advice relationship, and they put lack of sustain engagement on sustainability as a top reason for that. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there's other research to show that probably 20% of clients are actually actively looking for sustainability solutions, but they go outside of their advice relationship and do it through the internet because they don't feel like they're being served in, in this space. Yeah. So the, the number of, as an average probably sits around the kind of 20 to 25% of every client base uh, would want to talk about this. And so, you know, for an advisor, that's going to sit somewhere between kind of 
you know, eight and 30 clients, depending on the size of their client base. So it, it, it's meaningful. And obviously, in some cases, it's going to be far higher. Um, we've got some advisors who have kind of 50 or 60 of their clients using our platform. Um, and interesting to your, your point on demographics, we, we, we have no overriding demographics in our, in our client data. So we're almost exactly even between male and female clients. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is also another assumption that people make that this is maybe a, a female issue rather than kind of a holistic issue. Yep. Um, and, you know, I think our data shows that that is completely incorrect. We're also, we have no overweighting in any of the regions. So we have almost even exposure across the country, whether that be coastal areas, rural areas, mining areas, northern, southern, hot, cold. Um, as being, uh, as clients wanting to engage in this space. Um, and then the last thing is age. Um, so it's an interesting one, actually. And I think this is probably more typical to, to advice than necessary sustainability. But right. the, what we see from our clients is it's kind of like a barbell effect. So our, a lot of older clients want to talk about this and a lot of younger clients want to talk about this. The clients in the middle who are head down, trying to pay off their debt, trying to get their kids through school, have the bare minimum amount of time to do anything in their lives, yeah. they're the ones who, who who are less less driven by this. Yeah. But we do see it at, at kind of across the age spectrum, but kind of more weighted at those kind of older and younger ends, which, which I think people misunderstand. People mm. think, well, there's a client in their 70s, they're not going to want to talk about this. I think what we find is absolutely a client in their 70s wants to talk about this because they have time and knowledge access to information and technology, and they're probably being driven by their kids to have this conversation. And and very aware of leaving a legacy for their grandkids. Like 100%. I think they like they become very aware of that. It's it's all about what's going to be left behind. And this is another way that they can have an impact on that. And I think, you know, right now is I think the first time that many people will have been viscerally aware of what's going to happen in the future. Like yes. I think it's becoming this real thing, whereas I think it was a, oh, they're saying that, but really, do I believe it? Like, even if somebody was supportive, I think in the back of their mind might have been, but I mean, it can't be that bad, can it? You know, whereas I think everybody's becoming really aware of the fact that whole islands will disappear, you know, in short order. Absolutely. Like, there's this really sort of visceral realization, I think, for grandparents, it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know, I need to start making decisions because my grandkids are going to be dealing with this. Uh, absolutely, and and we're de we're definitely seeing that. And I think you know, data from the US just came out in the last uh, ten days or so. So this isn't Australian relevant necessary, but you know, related to to very similar kind of country and and, and style, is that um, across the generations, but admittedly mostly led by kind of millennial down to Gen Z. For the first time ever, there is active data to show that these clients are willing to sacrifice a return to get a more sustainable outcome. Right. And again, that I mean, that's a huge shift because that's always been an assumption in the past that um, nobody would ever want to do that in their right mind. Right. Um, but actually what we're seeing is that um, people who are heavily engaged in this space are less conscious of return to ensure that they've got values. Now, yeah. of course, they still want to get an equal return, and most of the time they will get an equal or better return. Yeah, uh, That's not actually the question here, but I think the question here is is the motivator and how seriously are people actually taking this. And yeah. I'd say that that's the kind of data that points to the fact that people are taking this very, very seriously and taking a very, very long-term view on this. Um, because it is a legacy issue as much as anything else. And look, it's an inter I think it also requires us to sort of face the constructs that we've just gone along with, and and not. And I don't say that in a judgmental way at all. I just, I mean, I, and I fall firmly to this. I've got an actuarial degree. I've worked in corporate finance and M and I've worked on the trading floor, right? So I've been a party of this sort of environment for a long time. And and you know, there's things you don't question, and growth. Is one of them, you know. So we talk about, oh, but China doesn't have enough growth. Now, if you're worried about the planet, then not having growth might sound okay. Do you know what I mean? Like it's like, well, wait a minute, That's population tough, growth is probably underpinning almost all of this stuff. Like rapid mm -hmm. population growth has been this sort of, you know, impact and virus on the planet. So I think there's there's some you know, evolution of our own understanding of where all that's coming from that requires us to sort of almost second guess or rethink some of these foundation things that we all just sort of operate within. And that's where, like you say, people start going, well, hold on, 
maybe I do need to accept something that's not quite as aggressive in that sense, maybe with returns, because the other bit's important to me, you know, and yeah, and so I think, you know, having a tool that helps them assess that is really really, really valuable. Let's talk about the the team members, say, in an advice practice. So clearly an advisor is going to be, um, you know, that they they folded this into the practice. An advisor is is engaging with the tool. Are there other, you know, resources in the team that you then find are in and out of the tool? Power planners presumably might utilise the tool as well. Who else gets involved in the process? Yeah, so, so again, it really, it really depends on, on who and, and how we're engaging. So um, a, as an example, we work with some fantastic groups. So we have got a partnership with Count Financial, uh, which allows all of their advisors to access our platform. We just launched a very similar partnership with Spark Financial, mm-hmm. which again allows all of their advisors to access our platform. And they're, they're, they're approaching it for, for slightly different reasons, but ultimately underpinning it is their desire to ensure they've got the, the best solutions for their clients and the current technology solutions for their clients, but also driving towards kind of their own kind of impact business agendas, partic- particularly in, in, in Spark's case. Um, you know, they've just moved to a, a profit for purpose model and sustainability and having that pillar around ethics and sustainability is incredibly important for them. Yeah. So we're their provider to help their advisors do that. The reason why I bring that up is because that that's one of the ways in which we engage, which kind of reflects on, on who kind of has access to the platform. So in those kind of group or dealer group arrangements, um, it's often actually at a research level and a product level. So we get researchers coming in using our platform, using it to help build some of the model portfolios or some of the solutions but also ensuring that they are capable of supporting their advisors should the advisors have any questions. Yeah. Um, that then scales all the way down through to advisor and advisor using it directly with their clients to then um, power planners and other kind of research and support staff accessing the platform as well. So because it's the entire advice process, it really does stream from discovery and conversation to analytics and research to actually producing an SOA. Um, yeah. And so you're pretty much going to get everyone across the business involved in it. And it would be a wonderful exercise, actually. I could see, I mean, we're, you know, for our business, we're always looking things to, you know, engage with the team on their own personal development, on on something that's either about their well-being or or something that sort of extends them as an individual. And, and so to do this assessment for the team as individuals could be fantastic. Mm-hmm. And what a great conversation prompter where they can then talk about what the result was for them and, and why and what their history is. I think that's a, that's a really, really interesting and deep connection you could start to be building between your team members. You know, that's something a bit more meaningful than, gee, I've bought stocks once. You know, I mean, there's this sort of cavern that exists between, (laughs) you know, advisors and support. And I think this could be one of those things that really crosses, um, bridges that gap um, because it's just, it's your personal experience, right? It's just where you come from. Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, in general, you a bit of a sweeping statement, but you know the the power planners and the the support teams within a practice are the younger generation, um, and they're they're the ones who really get motivated by by this in particular, and and seeing it um, be part of the process, seeing clients being engaged by it, and seeing the, the the changes that then get made throughout the kind of the processes and the way that the business engages with clients is is, is really really powerful. And you know we we've had that feedback directly from a lot of those younger people with involved in the business of, you know, how excited they are that, you know, what they believe personally is now being kind of reflected in the practice and, and how clients are being engaged. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that client engagement piece. So um, what what I liked, you know, I took a look and, and you know, the uh, values assessment process. This is really visual. You know, it's using language that clients are going to understand, you know, that's me or that's not me. You know, I love this sort of stuff when we just, we write things as if a human being would say them, you know, heavens to Murgatroyd. <laughs> um, yeah, it's absolutely. not that common in financial <laughs> services, right? But I'm curious, is there any assistance you also give to practices on that early engagement piece or introducing it to their client base, marketing, you know, or, or any sort of content that can sort of help with introducing this into the practice and its clients? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we, we do have a full resource library for advisors and that, that stems from everything to um, we have templated emails, which they can, which advisors can use to kind of go out and introduce this to clients. Uh, we have templated scripts um, so they can think about how they might want to engage and kind of verbally introduce this with clients. 
Um, we have information that details what everything on our platform essentially means. So, you know, when we say, um, you know, a category around, um, I don't know, working mother friendly, for example, what does that actually mean? Right. So in the platform, you, you can you can tap a little button and it will explain it all. And when we explain it again, we take this kind of very agnostic approach. And so we always try and include um, an argument for this and an argument against it so that the client can make their decision. But an advisor needs to know what it is. Um, and so we provide all these resources so that they're, they're prepared and ready to go should they get any questions. The most important thing that we do actually with advisors is is we, as part of our um, engagement, every advisor gets a free onboarding session. And then we also do a walkthrough with them with their first client. Um, so they're not just left to, to kind of go and do it themselves. Um, we make sure that we're there with them to get them comfortable. And of course, you know, we, we, we provide excellent support to make sure if there are any questions, if there's anything coming through from clients, um, that they can reach out to us. And in some instances, we've, talk, we've spoken to clients directly on behalf of advisors. Um, you know, if there's just a, a gap there in the knowledge or, or gap there in the level of comfort. Um, and, you know, so we are a business. We're not just a technology business. We're really there to kind of help the advisor and help take their clients on that journey. Perfect. And in terms of then, you, you know, you sort of describe this as, as a standalone sort of tool that's part of the risk profiling process. Does it integrate at all yet? Is there any plans for it to integrate with other tools that advisors might be using? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, we are fully integrated with X-Plan at the moment, being, yep. you know, the most obvious in the market. And so essentially <laughs> what it means is we can share data um, between platforms, which, you know, for an advisor means that's very easy. They can pull in client data, they can pull in portfolio data, and they can pull in their APL data. Um, and again, that that's a really, really important point to touch on is that advisors can work within their universe and their environment not just ours. So we provide research on hundreds of thousands of different investments, but we actually allow the advisor to boil it down to kind of what's what's theirs and what has been pre-agreed, which is a very useful thing. Mm. Um, We're also in the process of integrating with Hub24, so that will be up relatively soon. And then we have a whole program of kind of other integrations uh, coming down the track. We don't need to be integrated. The way we built the platform is the client can use it without any integration. Um, We started with XPlan being the major player, but yes, gradually kind of doing the other things as we go. Yeah, fair enough. And I guess there's a question actually that's just occurred to me. So this, what we've been talking about is heavily into the the first time the client does this sort of process. So they've been introduced to the concept and they're engaging. Uh, are there ways in which this can be part of a review process and are there advisors doing that where they're sort of re reassessing or, or rechecking, you know, portfolios against those values, even getting the client to to check that those values are still current for them? Is that how you'd propose that they engage with the tool? Absolutely. I mean, it, once it's been done once, we expect it to be done between client and advisor and clients, more importantly, <laughs> expect it to be done between client and advisor on pretty much every engagement. So anytime... Yeah. We're doing an annual review, whether that be a quarterly review. This conversation is being had just to reassess that the alignment is the same. Yeah. Um, but it's also, you know, customers' values do change as they gain knowledge and understanding in a particular area. And so they need the opportunity to be able to bring this to the fore. Yeah. One thing that we are working on, um, which a few advisors have asked us for, is actually an alert system. Um, so we're in the process of building this now. So if in between a review, something changes, uh, say in an investment portfolio that now may have previously aligned, but now misaligns or vice versa, will now actually be able to alert the advisor to what that change is. And so they can communicate directly with their client. Okay, um, That's something that will be out before the end of this year um, as a kind of a, a big drive forward to kind of keep that ongoing awareness and engagement between client and advisor. Fantastic. Um, so talking about the advisors you've already got in the, and you've got clearly quite a number of them already using the tool, then is there anything you've seen them um, use that you've just surprised you how they've implemented it or that, that worked really well? Or conversely, anything in there that's a bit quiet, you know, people sort of haven't discovered and you think it's really got some gold that they should be taking advantage of? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, the the, the, the thing that advisors love is the is the profiling piece. I mean, as you said, it, it's highly engaging, it's simple to use, it's there for their clients and it drives a huge amount of client value yeah. um, in that engagement. So that, that's definitely the number one piece. The area that advisors also love is our comparison tool. 
Um, so we've built this system which works in a very similar way to say an insurance comparison tool. So you kind of line things up side by side so you can see what everything looks like. But the way that our platform works and another kind of fundamental underpinning of our platform is that when you're in a client view, everything on the platform relates to that client and their profile. So every time you create a set of comparisons, it is just for that client. So you're not comparing things agnostically or without opinion. It's actually to that client. And so each client view is going to be different. So that ability to go, um, you know, maybe we have portfolio A or portfolio B. Let's sit them side by side. Let's see exactly where the alignment or misalignment is. Let's use that as part of our research. And importantly, let's actually can, can use that in um, our compliance file and our audit trial as some of our decision making. So, so advisors really, really like that. I mm-hmm. think one area that is underused is our insights portal. Um, so within the platform, we actually, uh, you, we are able to track every single decision or outcome that is made between client and advisor. Now, obviously this is uh, anonymized, so we're not sharing names for an advisor or a client, but they will see trends. So for example, are the majority of clients leaning towards particular areas around environment? Um, that are the real, real drivers for them versus maybe trying to step away or or step away from kind of more social orientated issues, just very broad examples. What that means is it allows the advisor to see the trends of their client base, respond to the trends of their client base, use that both for marketing, but also potentially um, how they think about constructing their managed fund solutions in the future. So if 90% of their clients don't want exposure to a particular area, there's a, you know, there's a really big flag there to go get this out of the portfolios and tell everyone about it and tell them why. And so we think that's really powerful. We understand why advisors probably aren't quite there yet. Everybody is very early on this journey, but I think in the years to come, it's that kind of information and that kind of data um, that is going to become increasingly important to how advisors and practices run and manage with their clients. And it's it's a, a great concept. I love the idea of of having that information for even content, you know, for social media or for content, because when we're um, trying to interact on these sort of things, it can become a bit oh, lectury or do you know what I mean? Like it can come across potential, well, you sh- thou shalt do this. Whereas to just give insights, like you say, to just go, hey, what we're seeing is this is a great way to start a conversation. Like it just is something to debate, you know? And, and it could be different. You know, what yeah. practice A versus practice B, you know, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne, for example, they're going to see different trends um, and being able to provide very bespoke solutions to your clients in your area is incredibly important. And, you know, it's, it's one data point of many, um, but it's a really powerful one. And and what I like too is is what you're getting is real data points, not assumed. So we all make all these assumptions. We were talking about them before about using tech or not or, or investing this way or not, you know, but this is real data. This is what they are responding to. And so, you know, that's so valuable. Um, you mm, know, what will – I mean, insight, absolutely. Right. And as we go further, I can just see advisors like, well, this is great, but I need you guys to ask more questions because I want to know other things about these clients too. Like what are the well, other I mean, things that, we that, should know? That's a, really, that's a really interesting point. That's a very interesting point. I mean, the, the question does get posed to us often of going, you know, we, we've started with sustainability values, but, you know, I think we're probably moving to a future where it's values everything, right? Yeah. You know, every decision is being made one way or another on a kind of a, a set of predefined values. And if you can understand what those are for a client, um, you can almost work out where they need to go and what they want to do. And that's not just sustainability, it's everything. Um, and so, yeah, we, 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 we'll be heading in that, in that way in, that, in the future for sure. I mean, the, the, the one that springs to mind for me is the whole intergenerational wealth transfer. You know, there's going to be, we're all going to be need to be asking better questions about what they want to happen down the track. You know, where, the, how they want this money to be handled, like any, all of those sort of things. Yes, you know, can be part of the normal fact finding process, but people's approach to that um, can be something you can draw out through tools. You know, you can draw these things out and let you then bring it up. Um, and I think that um, that's what I like about things like this is it can be a starting point. It prompts the conversation and then you get the deep discussion after that. You know, and that's what the advisors need to capture is what else they say because of the feedback you give them on a tool like this. You know, it's Absolutely. it's it's that deep, that granular stuff that's fantastic. So what else is on the development part, path and is there any, you know, wonderful blue sky stuff way down the track? 
uh, there's there's some blue sky stuff coming. I, I may, maybe not the place to talk about it quite now. I don't want to give too much out to the competition. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, we're 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 um, doing a couple of things at the moment. So we're we're constantly improving and rethinking kind of some of the categories that we deal with. So, for example, we're just launching one that is uh, energy transition, and so it's it's to help advisors and clients deal with this idea of going well. You know, particularly in Australia, energy is a you know a hot topic, yeah. um, particularly around sustainability. And there is um, you know a section of fund managers and clients and advisors who want to support um, energy solutions that are heading towards and who've made a commitment to transition. Um, so we're building a category that that does a better job of recognising that. Yeah. Um, we're using market leading data providers and independent industry bodies to help build our data criteria around that. But again, bring it into this really kind of systematic, friendly way that a client can go, oh, yeah, that's me. I get that. That's that's mm. what I want um, to bring that in and then to kind of help improve some of the portfolio solutions. We're also just releasing the kind of first steps of our AI capability, as everyone is. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Um, but we are we are relying on you know some of the fantastic stuff that's come out of these concepts around chat GPT and large language models yeah. and essentially built our own version of that that's contained within our environment so it's safe from a data perspective yeah um, that that does a couple of things it, it overcomes this kind of problem in sustainability and ESG data in that um, it is typically stationary for a year until there's annual reporting. It's right. not very good at capturing live events. So things that happen on a daily, weekly, monthly basis that could be relevant to, to an advisor or a client when they make their decisions. We're also now able to give much, much better reasoning as to why a company or a holding might be flagged to a particular issue. You know, so if, um, I don't know, company A has been flagged to issues around child labor. What does yeah. that actually mean? When was this flagged? Why was this flagged? And how is that now being dealt with? And so, again, we're providing much more clarity and granularity into to why things are being flagged and the information that then can then be shared back to the client. And, you know, so it could just be that a company was flagged, say, in 2017, Apple being a really interesting one, right? It, it's in most tech based portfolios these days yeah if a client says they don't want exposure to child labor it's going to get flagged because there is an exposure but what we are now able to provide is the exact details of when the registered exposure comes from but exactly what apple have done since then to fix those problems and what they're doing ongoing to fix those problems so again it comes down to a level of transparency and a conversation between client and advisor to go well actually you know what I'm pretty happy they're headed in the right direction. I acknowledge, I appreciate the transparency, but let's move forward. And, and I mean, you could argue that, I mean, so, you know, startups and all these new businesses that are going to come and compete with some of these players are fantastic. So absolutely funds moving that way is great. But mm -hmm. how exciting would it be if some of the biggest players actually shifted their game significantly? Like that's actually going to have a bigger impact, right? If you're big miners, if all these people actually, like you say, transition, like moved where their focus was, I mean, that's the you know, that's when we party in the street in terms of, of impact on the, on that issue. And so I like the idea of almost rewarding that by being a bit more granular about looking at when they got flagged and for what. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there's a whole nother hour long podcast between <laughs> you and I to have exactly this conversation. Uh, but yeah, ultimately that, that's, that's, our, that's, that's one of our missions as a business internally is that one of the big key reasons why we want to deal with advisors is because they are an intermediary or a conduit to a huge amount of global wealth. If we can engage advisors at a global level, and so we are about to launch into the US, for example, and we'll launch into other North American and uh, European markets at some point next year, co collecting this information and this actionable data from advisors across the world becomes the point at which we can then influence these very, very large corporations. Unfortunately, we're still in a world where where, where money talks, um, and so we need to be able to drive that and show the data of how that's talking to drive change. Um, but that that's kind of our internal mission, our goal of, of where we want to see the future. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I think we'll get there. I'm confident. And what a what a fascinating. I mean, I'd love to um, catch up then down the track and and take a look at well, hey. 
you know, you've got the political environments for different countries and what they're willing to do or not willing to do versus the public. And what you guys are going to have is the public's representation. Like this is how they're feeling and this is what they're willing to do. And so to look at that country by country and compare it almost to their p- political agendas that are sort of view, their view is they're leading the charge, but is that really where the charge is led? You know, maybe it is where the money is and where people are willing to direct it. So it'd be a fascinating look, you know, to match those up um, in different jurisdictions globally. Globally. 100%, especially between Europe and the US, for example, right. again, for another day. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now, is there anything we've missed? Have we have we missed any features or any elements of the tool? I, I don't think so. I think we, we've covered a huge amount today. I mean, all I would say is that, um, you know, particularly for those, those dealer groups that I mentioned between Count and Spark, um, you know, there are benefits with joining up, including there are discount codes for both of those groups. So yep. if you contact us directly, we'll let you know what those codes are. Uh, but also anyone listening to this podcast, if you sign up to the platform and use the code Ensemble10, you'll get a 10% discount to the subscription fee on the platform. Um, and of course, all the other services are there as they would be. You get full access and full support, but you know, we just want to say thank, thanks for listening and being part of the ensemble team as we are. Um, and yes, yeah, get 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 on board, and we can we can help and work with you. Yeah, get informed. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about OCO Advisor, then the website link is in the show notes, so episode show notes, so you can find it there. We've also popped in Tom's LinkedIn details. Um, he might not be the person that needs to direct uh, talk to you directly, but I'm sure he'll point you in the right direction should you reach out to him um, when he sees LinkedIn. I guess maybe without the apps on your phone, maybe it'll take a little longer for him to see your <laughs> message. And kudos to you for doing that. Uh, thank you so much, Tom, for joining us here today on the show and really sharing how OCO Advisor can help us begin our and our clients' journey towards sustainable investing. Thank you so much for your time. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. Okie dokie. So are you a current user of OCO Advisor? Um, I think there'd be lots of uh, listeners that would be really interested in how you found it, how you've implemented it, and maybe how your use has evolved over time. Um, So please share your insights on the Ensemble Community Platform. Uh, We'd all love to hear your take. I think we're all at various stages on this journey, um, but I think over time there'll be far more practices that um, fold in this type of discussion and understanding for their clients than not. And it's just a matter of the way in which we do that, whether it's more organic or whether we put some structures in place. And so I think this is a great way to sort of get a sense of what your options might be. As for, you know, my thoughts, there was a couple of things that stood out for me. I think, you know, so Tom mentioned in passing about, you know, older advisors, therefore talking to younger younger advisors. I think the concept of reverse mentoring is really powerful for some of these, some of these things or projects that we end up implementing. It can be not just a valuable transition, you know, transfer of insight and information, but it's also particularly empowering to younger staff members to be recognized for their lens, their their experience or their insights or their take on what the, you know, the Australian public might be interested. In. So I think, you know, using this as an opportunity to set up some of that reverse mentoring, I think is a fantastic thing to do. Um, even getting them to point to places that they get their information, who are they following, who are they interested in, why do they believe that, you know, that sort of thing, I think can give us all context for when we have these conversations with our clients. The other thing that stood out, I think, is... Um, Look, you know, to date, there's been a, an evolution of um, tools and, and ways to engage clients on these topics. And what's interesting is probably, you know, we've all taken it, very, I mean, understandably very seriously. But I think what happens then is it can feel a bit like a chore for a client in terms of the experience. And so I think, you know, having the question come up, um, like you say, like Tom was saying, as part of, you know, a, a risk profile questionnaire, these are sort of things that you you have value and want to dig into deeper. And then sort of almost, um, you know, telling the client, okay, we're going to, we're going to dive in deeper. There's, you know, a, um, profiling tool we're going to use to help us do that. You know, think of it a bit like, you know, which Harry Potter character are you? We're just trying to, <laughs> um, you know, get some, get an idea of your particular values, what you think is important, um, you know, to identify, you know, are you Slytherin or, or are you Ravenclaw, right? So I think there's a way to help 
clients understand that, like Tom was saying, this isn't right or wrong. This is about just where do you sit, you know, and what's your unique characteristics. So I think um, I think we could make this a bit more fun than it, than it may be, you know, for, for many of our clients. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's ways that we could sort of introduce this. It could even be interesting um, sharing some of the takes for the staff and, and where they come from on these issues with the clients. There might be blog posts or other things that we could all do that would help um, clients get closer to us and, and our own beliefs on these issues. Now, as you know, there's only one skill we need to become Vionic Advisors, and that's avid curiosity. Right, so to help build that habit, today's Curiosity Corner website that I'd love you to take a look at is McCrindle. This is mccrindle.com.au. McCrindle is M-C-C-R-I-N-D-L-E. Now, you may have actually seen Mr. McCrindle himself um, the presented a conference um, and he would have been talking about uh, demographic trends or things like that. And so that's what the business McCrindle does is it's it's um, demographic data insights into the different uh, age groups and trends in uh, the workplace or in consumer land, all that sort of thing. Now, the reason that I, I would point you towards their website right now in particular, but generally it's something that I do follow is they've just recently released their Generations Defined report. And basically, this takes a fresh look at each of the key generations out there and what trends that McCrindle have drawn out of their surveys they do with the consumers and what, you know, what trends they're seeing, um, what they're interested in, where they get their information, even what learning styles they broadly have, um, how it differs between them and their parents and other generations. So it's, it's really, um, I mean, it is pigeonholing, right? So, and I think, you know, they'd accept that this is, it's certainly putting labels, but I think it can be very useful when we're embarking on something like considering sustainable investing, then to understand the different ways the different groups might approach this um, and where they'll be getting their information from. What style of learning will they respond to? So, you know, the things like, so I'm taking a look at the report here and it's got this one page that sort of side by side lines up the generations, you know, so Gen X, um, you know, might uh, take advice from, and they're talking advice in a broader sense than just financial advice, but might take it from, advice from or be influenced by practitioners. So these are the people out there doing it, right? Um, we fall firmly into that category. Whereas Gen Y, it's more likely to be their peers, you know, and Gen Z, it's likely to be form- forums, chat forums, right? So they're on there and they're all chatting to each other. So understanding that and understanding what that means about how they're going to engage then with an expert when they do, I think can be really useful. So, you know, I sort of, I've, I follow these guys and, and always, um, you know, opt in to get those insights. Um, some of it will be, well, of course, moments and some will be like, ooh, really? You know, so um, I'd encourage you to check it out, um, particularly the Generations Defined Report, but there is a whole lot of other resources and tools that they've got on their website. Some of it relates to um, the working generation, some of it relates to education, how that's going to work. Some of it's about the future consumer. There's all sorts of tools there um, and a whole lot of fun ones too. If there's something you want to engage differently with your client base. They've got the baby names report for 2023, right? So there's just a whole lot of um, interesting information, infographics, all sorts of things that I think either could inform the way we each engage with the public or be something fun we could share with the public um, as an insight as part of our content. So um, check it out, mccrindle.com.au um, and you know, let me know if there's something that was a real standout for you or something you found exciting about that content. Well, whew, that's all we've got for this week. It is a little bit of a long one. Um, hopefully that was a valuable chat with Tom there. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if, look, you know, we're well into, I think this is episode 54 or thereabouts. Um, if you're now at the point where it's like tech overwhelm and you're starting to wonder if you need to actually streamline the tech you've got rather than add more apps to the business, then can I just I encourage you to, to nudge your dealer group um, to reach out to me as I've been actually doing more sessions and workshops at conferences recently around this sort of paradox of advice tech abundance versus its potential drawbacks and how, in fact, some advice tech minimalism might work for you. You know, what are the habits you can put in place that can really keep your advice process humming, but make sure that you're taking advantage of the technology you do have. So if you're curious about that, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's forward slash 
slash PeterMD, P-E-I-T-A-M-D. And we can certainly have a chat and then I'm happy to then chat to whoever might be the conference organiser for your particular group. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. (laughs) 